Now, we're going to back uh, to uh, the seven fools. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. You discount the first four words of the Bible and you can't be saved. You, if you can't buy the first four words that God puts on tablet, you cannot know him in salvation. Amen. The first fool was the atheist. In Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's like a person looking at a beautiful painting and declaring there was no artist. That's what a fool is. The atheist has said in his heart, there is no God. Looking uh, this morning uh, from Isaiah 55, he says this, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts from your thoughts. That's how, that's how different it is. Astronomers have now found galaxies 12.3 billion light years away from earth. Let me say it again. 12.3 billion light years from earth they, that we know that they're there. Now, let me put that in perspective. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So uh, from, for light to travel from the sun to the earth, that's an eight-minute trip. But for light to get from the farthest galaxy to earth would take 12 point three billion light years to get there now that's the best thought you've ever had about God has missed the mark 12.3 billion light years God is so far away he says my thoughts are higher than your thoughts how far 12.3 billion light years that's a long way folks you'd have to stop several times for gas that's a long way the best concept of God you've ever had has missed the mark by 12.3 billion light years. Yet the fool continues to say in their heart, there is no artist, there is no painter, there is no creator. And that's why, folks, they can do anything in their mind that they think they could do is because there is no absolute moral authority over their life. But we don't fight them. And the church is making a mistake today by making those people our enemy. We are not fighting the LBGQ, I forget the last one, uh, folks. Now, do we, do we love them as having a soul? Yes, we do. Do we hate the sin? Yes, we do. Just like we hate our own. There's no difference in theirs and ours. We just think theirs is different. Do we hate people that, that are, are saying we have a, a, a black national anthem rather than the national anthem? No. Are they confused? Yes. Do we love them because they have a soul? You see, our first response is not to be mad at everybody who does not have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because if you're mad, you're never going to lead them. You're never going to win them. They're, the fool has said in his heart there is no God because he's, he or she sees no um, moral authority over their life, and they see no justice coming. They think when you die, you're dead. You're gone. That's why they're trying to save whales. That's why all the Hollywood stars will pay all the money to save all the pets in the world. They're leaving their fortunes so that dogs and cats can be spayed and neutered. While millions and millions and millions of unborn children in this world are killed. We're trying to save the seals and letting our own babies die. See, folks, if, if you get mad right now and you storm off opinionating yourself right now, we haven't got to the big five. You think masks is a big deal. You wait till the vaccine is ready. The top five drug companies that are producing a vaccine right now all use live stem cells from aborted babies. Now, what are you going to do now? You haven't even seen the fight yet. So if you're off over here storming around about a mask or no mask, folks, you ain't even seen the battle yet. The fool is said in his heart, there is no God. There's no artist. There is no moral authority. And there is no design and order. Everything about God is design and order. He has created design and order. In fact, at the end of every creational thought came an action, and he said, that's good. 
That's good. That's good. Fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He says, my thoughts, Isaiah 55, are not your thoughts. Now, when we consider this, this concept of fools and atheists, folks, we're dealing with... We're dealing with American government people. We're dealing with governors now. We're dealing with city uh, mayors who we're finding out are a progressive people who are population control people, pro-abortionists, who actually believe that there are too many people on this planet. And so part of their mission is we just have to do this because it's the right thing to do. Did you know right now that you could fly every human being in the world, every human being on the globe today, fly them to Oklahoma City, fly them into Will Rogers Airport at Oklahoma City, get them off the plane, and give everybody three square feet to stand on, and you could put every person in the world in the city limits of Oklahoma City. Wow. Well, what is that? It's a lie of Satan. Because there is no God, we're going to decide there's too many people. That's why abortion is such the heart cry of a people who have lost sight of who God is. Fool number one, the atheist, said in his heart there is no God. Fool number two is the taunter. And, and let me say, um, before we move, move past it, I read a beautiful story. You, you probably never heard of Sundar Singh, S-I-N-G-H, um, great preacher from India. One, I read one of his devotionals once, and uh, he was traveling he was well-known in northern India and into the Himalayas, which uh, I, I've tried that same path. I've been in the Himalayas and working in, in the Nepal and Kathmandu and northern India. But anyway, he, he's on a trail with a companion, and they're walking in the snow. It's coming down harder and harder, and they're trying to make it to a village, and they see a man laying in the path. Sundar Singh looks down at the guy. He's still alive. He tells his companion, let's get him uh, to the village. He said, we can't take him. In the we'll all die. We'll freeze to death. I don't want any part of it. He's going to die. The companion left. Sundar Singh, a, a small boned man, he put the dying man on his back. And, and as he carried him, he continued to stoop over. But he kept going step after step after step. And, and pretty soon his body heat was rising because he's carrying all this weight through the snow. It translated into the man feeling the, the heat himself, and he revived himself. And within another two, two miles, he was actually helping Sundar Singh, and they were holding on to one another when they came upon a man laying in the path. They looked down, and he'd rolled him over, and it was the companion. He had frozen to death and died. What I'm saying to you is, while the fools continue to say there is no God, let us be the one who still puts those on our back and travels, reviving them, bringing spiritual and fresh air of Jesus Christ into their life, because that's what God honors. The churches who are passing the people up saying, we're not going to minister to you, we, we don't like you, you're not like us, uh, will never get that opportunity to feel the freshness of revival. And seeing God work in lives. The taunter is next. The taunting fool. The taunting fool is the one who mocks at sin. Proverbs 14, 9. Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor. How many of you like favor? I love favor. Do you ever pray that? Lord, may I find favor with you today? What did it say about Jesus when he was a young boy? It said that as he grew in stature, he also grew in favor with God and in favor with man. See, when you make that, you pray. hey, boys, y'all come up here, boys. Y'all come up here. Help me preach this sermon, all right? Any other boys their age that are not in, in that, that, come on up, guys. Now, fellas, it's good to see y'all this morning. Look, we all know that they're not, you know, these boys are not the sharpest knives in the drawer. We, we got that. <laughs> but they are handsome to look at, aren't they? Listen, <laughs> Boys, what's a fool? What's a fool? Someone who doesn't believe in God, right? Right. That's a fool. Are you all fools? What does it say? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. What does that mean? It's, it's tied up in there? What? Do you do stupid things? Does Bo do stupid things? Yeah. <laughs> That's another story. So you're going to do foolish things, but that doesn't make you a fool. It means that you're, for a while you're doing foolish things. Now, two weeks ago, 
one of your group, he's not here today, I gave a special knife. And when that was all over, I was met with some of you guys with this question. How come he got a knife? <laughs> I want to make a, a wonderful point about young men is that they are always seeking and, and establishing and balancing what is right and what is truth. How many of you as parents and grandparents, your children have said, that's not fair? <laughs> Anybody? Y'all ever say that? Y'all ever say it's not fair? Yeah. yeah oh, I guess so. Did you know that's foolish? Because life is never fair. Life was not designed to be fair. The cross was not fair. Persecution is not fair. But here's, here's what I want to say to you. Hand me that box right there, Jake. And if some of your other buddies come, I'm going to give you all something very special. Uh, how many of you belong to these boys? I mean, they, you, you are legally responsible for these guys. Okay. All right. You have to make sure that that's going to be okay with them. Because if you're not able to carry it at this time in your life, you will be. That's called a rabbit. Look at that blade, guys. It's really, really cool. I love boys. I love girls, too. But I'm going to tell you something. Boys become men and must be mentored by men. Yeah, go ahead and open them right now. That's cool. Oh, okay. I thought I'd have to teach them that. All right. All right. Okay, get out of here. I got I to gotta preach. Y'all get better. Here we go. Boys become men. They must be taught by men. The fool who is the taunter is the person who was never mentored by a man. And they taunt other people in their own misery. And they make a mock of, of sin. And they become foolish. Fool number three is the treasure stacker. Uh, this is the great story in the parable uh, where the guy says, oh, man, I'm doing so well, I can't get all the crops in the barn. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to build bigger barns. He had barns that were full and a heart that was empty. He never considered um, finding out God's will for his life. And so the end of this parable says this, Thou fool, knowest not that your life will be uh, required of you. And then look what Jesus says. Then Whose things will these be? Your legacy is not the president's pictures that you stack up in a bank. Your legacy is that right there. Your legacy is back in the nursery. Your legacy of these boys and girls. Your legacy is down in that arena. Your legacy is on the sports camp. It's down in the football field, in the baseball field, the volleyball field. And you talk about praying because we're going to stop and have prayer in a minute, a corporate prayer. Our teachers are headed back to an absolute uh, storm that's coming. We are headed for a fall. And, and by that I mean we are going to ask them to do Im literally impossible things in school. I, I, th I think we are headed in a, in a direction in which no one really knows where we're going, how it's going to work, or why it's going to work. And many churches have already signed off. Many churches are stating we will have no public service until January 1. Hundreds of churches have already come out and said that. What are we doing? We're throwing in the towel before we ever got in the ring. What do you mean? throwing? And so school is important because that's where we want to mentor is the one who says, I'm going to make a mock at all of you who are professing that there's a God in your life and, and make fun. That's the treasure stacker. Now, now we get to uh, number four, the wisdom hater. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and knowledge. The world is seeking enlightenment. Enlightenment. I don't know if you know, the newest business in our town today is called enlightenment. You know, it's over there by La Plata. It's called enlightenment. Anybody been by there? <laughs> enlightenment? The whole world is seeking enlightenment. Cool, man. When they need wisdom. But what does this fool, what does this fool do, do? This fool says, I reject two things. And this fool will always reject two things. He rejects and she rejects wisdom and instruction. Wisdom and instruction, without, that two, without those two things in your life, you cannot build a wise life. That's the wisdom hater. I hate anything that makes me surrender my will. 
That's the wisdom hater. I hate wisdom. I hate instruction. How many of you have said in the last year or two, just to yourself, I wish I could just sit on the back porch and have a talk with my mama. I just wish I could talk to my daddy. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. Mama would have something to say. Daddy could sure tell me something about this. See, we seek wisdom because we have been taught wisdom and instruction. Wisdom and instruction. Last night, a messenger hit, bing, and this lady said, I want to be friends with you. And they said, Pastor Bob, you won't remember me. But in 1990-something, the history teacher at County Line High School was tragically killed in a car wreck. And I was called in and asked if I would do her courses for just a couple weeks so that the school said that she was the most popular teacher in school. So I did it for a few weeks. The principal said, would you just, take, would you just become the, the history head of the department for the rest of this year? I was pastoring a church. I said, okay. She was one of those students, uh, that 25, 27, 30, 35 years ago. <laughs> wow. Uh, said, you won't remember me, but you call me motor mouth. And you always taught us. And I, and I would. I'd, if you didn't want to go to lunch and you're behind, I would let everybody, everybody come in at lunchtime and we'll work on. That's what I did. Anyway, I'm just saying to you today, you have influence of people that you don't even know who they are or where they're from today. And she, she said, I learned so much from you. Wisdom and instruction, those who are seeking it will find it. And see the thing, guys, knife boys. Y'all are here in church today because Papa, Nanny, Mama, Daddy, they got you here. You are not here on your own accord. None of you got up and drove to church today, right? No, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> you know what? You'll be a man someday is when you get up and you tell everybody else around you, come on, we got to get to church today. See, then you love wisdom and you love instruction because it was brought to you. See, it was brought to you. Well, now we'll move into the new fool's. The final three fools. Number, fool number five, the venter. Proverbs 29, 11. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Let me say it again. Proverbs 29, 11. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Here we go. If you begin a conversation like this, I usually don't say this, but you're venting. Now, please hear me, because it's going it's to offend some of you. Hear me and love me through this. We have so opinionated the mess that we're in that now we're even dividing good folks in a thing called mask world. Our first response to any crisis as a believer is paramount. He's called us to pray. For those. I understand anger. I understand mass no I get all that. But what I'm here to tell you is, as a believer in Jesus Christ, if you start your day authentic, if you start off, and usually on Facebook, if, you say, if, 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 the, if the sentence begins like this, I usually don't have a rant, but this is a rant, you're venting. You're not influencing. No one is influenced through anyone else's venting. No one. That's why, as a minister of the gospel, one of the things I'm held accountable for is, am I encouraging the saints through the word? Or have I slipped off into some private agenda because somebody's not agreeing with me or somebody said something to me or somebody has twisted something and so I go and hit the... We have no right or no place for any of that. So if you're venting right now, find a back door, a back barn, and go vent all you want. But when you pick someone and you say, listen, I'm just going to give you my, I'm going to, I'm going to give you my two cents worth. Trust me, you don't have the change. You don't need to do that. It's not worth it. No one is encouraged. No one is helped. Brother B wisely said, this is what the governor said. This is what we're doing. We're going to do our very best. But I'm telling you, this is not over. It's just beginning. 
So above all things, let not your personal opinion override or overside who you are in Jesus Christ. Do you want your identity as a believer in Jesus Christ to be known as the masker or the unmasker or the fighter of all? Do, do you really believe that's the hill you want to die on? Of course not. A couple of years ago, I made a statement in a sermon. There were two state representatives and one state senator in the service, and I made a statement. It, it turned out being a bad statement, but it was a good statement. But I talked about, in, in this thing about gun control, if, if I knew, if I knew that if I surrendered my three or four pistols and Jan's three pistols and Jan's four rifles and Jan's, uh, <laughs> if I knew that, I would save one child's life. If I knew that not one more little boy or girl would die by hand, I would gladly, I would bring every firearm I've got, I'd set it down and walk away from them and never say another word. But I know that that's not true. And it, it is one of those truths that we live with that is just hard to live with. He said, well, what was unliked about it? I, I followed that up by saying not everybody needs to have a gun. I know a lot of foolish people. <laughs> a friend of mine drove by around the church. He said, man, this, this is awesome. He said, what's your security like? And I said, well, we have sheepdog ministry. We have, and we can see everybody in all ten doors. We have doors locked. We have guys walking. But I said, hey, it's a cowboy church. Two-thirds of the people in there are packing, man. There ain't, no, there ain't nobody. <laughs> if all the churches that you're going to hit in this town, <laughs> I think we're last. When pickup trucks and horse trailers outnumber cars, I don't think we got a lot to worry about. But here's the deal. The venting fool tells all that's on the inside. Paul reminds us over and over and over again, we don't have a right to that. I'm not telling you not to be on Facebook and talk, and I'm telling you be on Facebook and be wise. You know what Jesus told the disciples when they were always in these conflicts? He said, I want you to do this. I want you to be wise as a serpent. And what? Harmless as a dove. Pick your fights, pick your battles. Folks, don't die on this hill. This thing hasn't even started yet. Is there conspiracies? Of course. We'll talk about them later at some point. Is there authoritative, autocratic rule, bureaucratic law? Oh, of course there is. We've been seeing that for months. Our governors making mistakes? Yeah, you better know it. What's our first response? We had to pray for those in authority over us. Pray for those in authority over us. Okay, we've got to keep moving. You know, if you're a venter and the conversation starts off with that, you're not helping the person you're talking to. You're not encouraging them. All of, all of us need somebody that we can talk to. That, uh, and that's what a friend is. A friend is somebody who can hear all that and not judge you for it. But be very, very careful. Because now, folks, and I love what our sheriff, I, I love what he wrote yesterday. He's a wise young man. I love what he said, and, but this is not about law and order today. This is about fools. The fool tells all that he knows, shares it all. How many of you have been in trouble and do not indicate this? Do not even make eye contact. Don't even look at me. Please look down. <laughs> How many of you have been in conversations the moment it was over? You said, oh, God, why did I say that? Why did I say that? Right? Of course. What is that? It's a foolish thought. It's a foolish moment. So the fool that vents does not encourage. Be angry and sin not. There is no influence in anger. You may find a book someday uh, by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist, a Jewish psychiatrist. And I think the book was called The Meaning of Life. When they took him to Auschwitz, there he lost his father and his mother, and there they killed his wife. They took everything he had. They took his clothes away from him. They took his number, his name away from him and gave him a number. His number was 119,401. A few years back, I had such a privilege to interview Russian Jews who had been in the Holocaust, and we made a documentary all in Russian. And it went to the University of Chicago. I would sit there and I would talk 
through the translator, the, the, the Russian Jewish missionary, and I would touch those imprinted, and they would barely, you couldn't really see them because of the blue ink fading, but you could still feel numbers. To hear their stories and to watch their tears as they, they lost their father and mother. Anyway, Viktor Frankl said this. They, they took my name away and gave me a number. They took my clothes away. They took my hair away. They pulled the fillings from my teeth. They took my personal possessions. They took my wife. They took my mother and my father. But he said this. They left me with the only freedom I had in my life. Everything can be taken away from a man but one thing. The last of all human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Wow. To choose one's attitude. So I am just saying to our whole church, our whole community, the faith community, to the many of you on Facebook this morning, to the many of you on the YouTube channel, I'm saying to you, let this not be a, a fight about our personal rights right now. Let this be a fight about right and wrong and how we're going to control our own attitude about the circumstance that we are in. Because just as the song saying that uh, Miranda had on with the video, may they see him in us and what we're doing. And when I'm ranting, folks, I'm not sure that's what the world needs to see of Jesus today. The venting fool. Uh, number six, the always right fool. So, uh, Proverbs twelve fifteen. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he who is counsel is wise. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. The Mr. Right, the Miss Right fool, always right, always right. I said something to Jan the other day, and she stopped dead still. And she said, say that again. You know what I had said? Honey, you were right. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> Honey, you were right. Don't we love that? But the always right fool is not. Have you guys never met this guy? I have met him. I have met him over the hood of a truck or a car who knows literally everything about life. I have met them. It doesn't matter what malady you had. They've already had it. And it was 17 times worse than you've got. They're always right. They never concede the fact that someone else could possibly be right. Once when back years and years ago, and I had a Christian school. One of the first, and we, we created a Christian school athletic league. And I was a basketball coach. We made it to the state. And... I was so tickled pink, we made it. Anyway, uh, I, I'd never been trained as a coach. I played high school ball. That's all I ever did. We're dribbling down, and the ball hits the referee's foot, and the referee blows the whistle, whistle and sends it the other way. I jump up from my seat, and I grab my towel just like I'd watch them. That's, that's what they're supposed to do. I grab the towel, and I throw it down, and I'm walking out there like that. And the referee says, he says, preacher, go read your rule book. The ref is part of the floor. You just hit the floor. Now sit down. <laughs> See, but haven't you met that guy who was always right? Doesn't matter. They taste your cooking. Mm, a little salt. They teach you, they, you, you, said you cooked it too long. Always right. Drives me crazy. But that's a fool. Always right in her own eyes. Woe be unto them who call evil good and good evil. Because that's the culture we're in now. They can't make up their mind what's evil and good. And then we move to the final fool, the phony fool. Jimmy read to you, Pastor Jimmy did, the, the, the parable of the virgins. Heaven will be likened to ten virgins who took the lamp. Now, 
This is one of 40 parables that Jesus give, gives. There are 10 versions. What, what, what is that about? A Jewish marriage, my friend, is the most beautiful, it's the most beautiful wedding ceremony there is. This thing goes on for a week. But at this part of it, these are bridesmaids. And so the party begins up at the bridegroom's house. He gets, his, he gets his guys out, and they get all suited up. They get their lights out, and they're coming down the street. Nobody knows when they're going to come. The, br- the bride is in there awaiting. But the, the bride's maids are, are ten virgins who are supposed to have one job. Have you ever been a bridesmaid? You know, the gene pool in bridesmaids' world is sometimes a little shallow as far as the thought processes and what's going on. They had one job. What was the job? Let us know when the bride's come, when the groom's coming. Let us know when the bridegroom's coming. Would you do that? Okay, no problem. But it said they all got sleepy. They all went to sleep. And then the announcement was, behold, the bridegroom comes. Five of them jumped up with the lamps that they had. They lit them. Other five jumped up with the lamps that they had. But here's the problem. They had no oil. Now, what's this thing about? First, let's look at the message of this. Who is the characters of this message? Who is it? The bridegroom? That's Jesus Christ. Am I not right? That's Jesus. He's going, who is the bride? That's the church, right? Who are the bridesmaids? That's the individuals inside the church. There are both wise and fools. There are those who have not only the light of the Holy Spirit in that lamp and the light of salvation in them, but they have the reserve of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are five who have nothing. They jump up and they say, hey, give us some of your oil. Why? Because they never had any. They had no intentions of having any. They didn't know that they needed any, and they didn't understand the purpose by which they're there. Folks, half of the church is probably unsaved, not this church, but the church worldwide. We have to come to the conclusion that there are many people who are saying, Lord, Lord, who have no Lord in Jesus. They are not saved. They have not been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. They're as lost as they can ever be. And they're bound and doomed for hell because of that. That's who these characters are. Let's look at the time frame. There are eight references from Matthew 24 to Matthew 25, eight references about he's coming, he's coming. Who's coming? Jesus is coming back. So the time frame of this is in the last days. And it's, in fact, he's talking about in the time of tribulation and right before the end of the tribulation, behold, he comes and he announces to the world, he's coming back. And the church is understanding that Jesus Christ is Lord and the believers are out of here. And he begins to deal with Israel. Did you know that from Revelation 3 to the end of the book, the church is gone? We're raptured out and God begins to deal with Israel again as a nation that there are uh, thousands upon thousands, 144,000 evangelists that will come from the 12 tribes and will evangelize the world. It's going to happen. The time frame of this is the end of the tribulation. Behold, he's coming in judgment. What's the message then? The message is, look, you've been, you've been given one job, one job. And I hate it when somebody gives me one job. You know why? <laughs> because if you mess that up, there's nothing else. Yeah, but look how good I did over here. <laughs> I've been one job, one job. If you're a teacher, you got one job. Get wisdom here to here. See? Yeah. If you're a preacher, you got one job. What? Wisdom here to here. Half of these people had no oil or didn't even understand what the oil was needed for. They're just along. So the, the, the ten virgin uh, parable, one of 40 that Jesus gave us, is to remind us we got one job. Be ready for his coming. I think the American church and the world church has lost sight of the fact, wait a minute, he's coming. He's coming. Jesus Christ is coming again. Jesus Christ is coming. Say that, whisper that to yourself. Jesus Christ, it's real. It's going to be the, the, the epitome of, of the end of this thing is he's coming again. We lose sight of that because it's been thousands of years. Look in your Bible, if you would, to Daniel, the book of Daniel. And we'll close. But you, O Daniel, 12, 4, shut up the words and seal the book. Shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. That's us. That's today. This is a prophecy that has been fulfilled. The Internet made that possible. We are an information, knowledge-hungry people. 
That's why our phones are going off 24-7. New info, new info, new info. And that's why we are so short-sighted on our ability to hear 35-minute messages because we need everything. Hey, how many of you ever watch uh, like Home Alone or Back to the Future? It comes back on the movie and you watch a, few, a little bit of it. You ever do that? You know why they do that? You want to know what their philosophy is? That there are movies that are classics that are in your mind represent something and you will watch that at least 15 minutes to get to that that line or that scene that you loved. And so during that time, they have you captured with the commercials that are going to be in that. That is an actual working philosophy of network television. That's why they replay and replay and replay. Also, there are so many channels now that they can't keep airways full. There is such a starving nature of more information that we do not possess the wisdom to handle the information. That's what Daniel 4, look just back a little bit in Daniel 11 though. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God, little g. He shall blaspheme against the God, capital G of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. What are we talking about now? We're talking about the Antichrist coming. We're talking about in the age of when the internet has allowed information to come freely in and out, all 24-7, and the hunger for more information whether it's right or wrong, whether it's fake or real. He shall regard, verse 37, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. Antichrist will either be Jewish or he'll be Muslim. And he will be homosexual. And he will lead the largest group of anti-God people the world has ever seen. He will not regard the natural use of women nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above all. 25 years ago, you could have not... You could not have seen where we are today. You would, you would have thought even the mark of the beast was going to be something where they're going, to, they're going to go into your house and break the door down, hold you down, and brand you. Now we're watching it on TV every day. Thousands of corporations are ordering their people to put the little chip in, an information chip. Preachers are falling for it by, by the grove, saying this is a wonderful thing. No longer have to carry cash. No longer will, be, will we have to have a, all this identification stuff. And we are being led, and you talk about conspiracy theories in, in our heart, we are being led right to it with this, it's for your own good. This is for you. This will help you. We love you. And I love it when, when Nike says, we're in this together. <laughs> when the car companies, uh, together we can overcome. Folks, you want to know about the Washington Redskins? You want to know why, they, why there'll be a name change? Because they were forced to by Pepsi-Cola and Nike. There, there's, you, you want to know why Walmart's doing what? They, they don't have a sudden heart and conscience. They know where the money is. They know what they have to do to keep money flowing. And that's the world that we're in. That's the, and, and we're setting it up. It's being set up. And we buy that hook, line, and sinkers. Oh, this is going to be so convenient. State of Mississippi, talking about being cashless, the state of Mississippi has a law since the 1800s. If you attempt to pay a bill with legal tender and they won't take it, the bill is canceled. No, I want to find out if Arkansas has that law. <laughs> hey, man. Pizza Hut says, sorry, we won't take your cash. Free pizza. <laughs> we, have, we got to check that out. The phony fool. Folks, these women in this story had no oil. Power invested of the Holy Spirit. If you're here without the power invested of the Holy Spirit, you are without Christ. Hell is your future. The, the phony fool is the one who's the worst. They're the worst of all. Because they've actually made themselves believe that it's all okay. That's the worst fool of all. Do you know your spiritual condition? Are you born again? Have you received Jesus Christ and that pardon that he gives you from your confession? Jesus, I am a sinner. I ask you into my heart this day. I'm going to say something to you that I want you to take and walk away with this from all of the plans that we have had for Mountaintop pretty well came to a halt. But I'm going to tell you something. 
in the midst of that, we have seen what he wants to do in a great and mighty way. We have seen God working. And how, how did this come about? Folks, you know, back in, in the 90s, when I was with a TV church, I walked away from and I said, I will never be involved, camera, TV, never, ever again. Well, guess what I do all the time? <laughs> I am finding a way to, to, to redo, 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 redo. And God is using it. God is using every part of the things that we thought we would not do, could not do, don't want to do. So please don't get caught up in this, this time of life that we're in, opinionizing everything, fighting even your friends and your neighbors. Because, folks, I, we have so many of our wonderful church folks who can't be here. And I would not want them to be here. It is dangerous for them still. And I understand that and I get that. This thing is real. I understand that. But for us to make statements about them or to them or, or to opinionize everything that we do just so that we look stronger and tougher. Listen, I, I remember getting off a plane in, in uh, South America in Quito, Ecuador. And it was when the swine flu was going on. We got off that plane. They isolated us because we were Americans and we were coming from the Fluville. They all put on gloves and they had masks and they took our temperatures and they checked us out and they asked us questions. I mean, it made us angry. All I was, don't you know I'm an American? You can't do this to Americans. So this is nothing new, but the panic level is so high this time. The fear is so high that it's causing many, many good people to say things they don't really mean or believe. We need to bring this down a notch, love our neighbors, try to help them out all that we can. Because we do want them to see Jesus in us. Now, I said we're going to have corporate prayer. Folks, our governor's popularity in the last 24 hours has gone from this to this. I'm not talking about the right or wrong of it. I'm saying pray for him. I'm saying pray for him. I look at the President of the United States. I don't even know how he's standing. I don't even, I don't even know how he has room for one more fight. I don't, I don't get half of it. He makes mistakes. He says ridiculous off-the-cuff things. But he may just be the only thing standing uh, for liberty. Pray for our congressmen and our senators and those in authority, our police chiefs, our sheriffs. I think the greatest thing that these people can know is, is the Mountaintop Cowboy Church is praying for you because we believe that's our number one weapon. I can be as witty as the next guy or gal with a pen. I can tear you apart. Listen, you can out-sing me, out-preach me, out-pray me, but you can't out-insult me. But that's not who I am. That's not what we want to see. That's not what the world needs. They need to know that Mountaintop Cowboy Church is one group of people. We may not always agree with you. We may not even understand what planet you're on right now. But we are praying for you. That's what I'm asking you as a church to do. This moment, this altar, turn around where you are. We do have to work at social distancing and the altar is a thing. You can spread out. Hey, this is a big old place. Turn around, use that seat, but somehow yield yourself before the Lord and begin to pray for those in authority over you. Would you do that as we, as we stand together? If you want to use this altar, you come. If you need to, to bow right there, you bow before him. But make some sort of gesture even in your head that you're bowing before the Lord, that you're coming before him and his holy presence. His, his Holy Spirit leading and guiding you to pray for those in authority over you. Just as I am. If you're here in this room this morning and you do not know Him as your Lord and Savior, it's about a five second walk down to this front where you can say, I confess Jesus Christ today. Maybe you're in this church today and you say, I want, I want to become a member of this church. Walk right down here and see our dear brother here. 
and he'll share with you how to become a member. But we want first for you to know that you're going to heaven. We want that settled. We want you to have that peace. If you need to be baptized, this is the day. This is the time to come and say to Brother Benny, I need to be baptized today or next week or whenever. I'm convicted. I need to be baptized. I need to follow him in this. You come right now. All over this building, people are praying for those in authority over us. We're praying for our many members who cannot be here. We're praying for our brothers and sisters who don't understand us. We're praying for the other churches who are, who are struggling on whether to meet or not to meet or, or how we're going to meet. We put no judgment upon them. We simply come and pray for them this day. played are you sure that you have peace in your heart about where you're going so many people walk this earth not knowing of their salvation this world is getting to be a scary scary place to live in I'd want to know where my spiritual home is are you sure that you have peace with him now And the peace of God shall keep our hearts and our mind. The peace of God. So as we roll forward, the peace of God must rule. I've talked a lot for the last few weeks about fools and foolishness and because that's where the world is. Literally is. But I'm also saying to you that God has created you to be wise to be a servant of his are you done now have you prayed to him have you surrendered that to him so father I pray for the many who have been seated or turned in their seats or dropped their heads or raised their hands or on their knees that we come to you seriously this morning praying for those who have authority over us we pray for our governor we pray for our legislators We pray for our Supreme Court judges in the state and the nation. Lord, literally every day decisions are being made that are obstructing freedom and introducing tyranny, so we pray for them. We pray the power of your Holy Spirit upon every church that we would not be the foolish virgins who use the oil, don't have the oil, and no purpose. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to show this church how to move forward regardless of what the world says or does. Give us that power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. May we love our families more than we ever have before. May we check on those who aren't able to be here. May our hearts be broken for those who are walking through illness and sickness and death. For those, Lord, who are uh, looking out windows of nursing homes this day, may we remember them and see how we can help them. May we leave this place today with our minds made up that we're not going to fight the world and our friends every day and every night, that we're going to love one another. We're going to honor you in every way that we humanly can. I pray for the conviction of every man and woman in this place and and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that are listening, that they may stand and live out their conviction. And may we honor that and give room for that. And we pray it now in your precious name. Amen and amen. Brother B.